Welcome to the Berks County Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm here with Dave Klein. And Dave Klein, you are one of the founders, really, of the Berks County Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so it's a pleasure to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about how this thing all started? Sure. <clears throat> well, you know, you guys here at the center were putting on a display about certain years of the 60s, the uh, really uh, poignant years, the Kennedy years, the Martin Luther King years, RFK. Um, and with all of that amazing history in the 60s uh, came a musical, fashion, cultural, sexual uh, revolution. All kinds of rev revolution, literally, right? I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, and I was thinking about, like, well, my parents, by the time they had me, they were maybe, like, 20. So, really, I was trying to relate to, like, I still like music from the 50s, and I was born in 55. So, by the time 65 came around, I was being influenced by some major musical talent and creativity, like the Beatles. I was only 10 years old. And I was trying to think, like, well, in my parents' era, they would have been born, like, in the 40s or whatever, or 30s, and... And they would have had like that whole good swing band sound. And, uh, but the 50s, that was really their heyday. So they were just kind of like, kind of going past the era I was in as I was learning, as all the doo wop and all that stuff was coming in, you know? So I was thinking that because I was thinking, how lucky am I to have been born in that specific moment in time to have like actually lived that whole cultural revolution that sure. tr truly changed the world? And we'll get back to that. So, but more directly to your question. So you guys are putting on this great display. Simon Bertolette and you contacted me and said, hey, um, at the newspaper, because I work at the Reading Eagle newspaper and at WE Radio, do you think you have any old pictures, old stories, maybe of the Beatles? Um, do you have any uh, record albums or whatever? I said, Simon, we have, a, we have a whole basement filled with records. It's embarrassing how many records and LPs and stuff we have down there. So first step was I let Simon come down and really like plunder the treasure chest of, because we didn't want it, you know? I'm sure he loved that. <laughs> and some of the things in the exhibit here that folks will see if they come to the History Center, some of those albums are, are here. And uh, you know, the, art, a revolution in art, pop art that also mm -hmm. went along with this. You could see those album covers. Each one of them, for the most part, was a work of art. Mm -hmm. I think that's something missing today with the MP3s and, and the downloads and stuff. Um, and then he was saying, well, you know, we want, can you help us promote this? Can we huddle? Can you help us with marketing and PR? I said, sure, I'll sit down, I'll brainstorm some things. You know, we've done that many times through the years. And out of that brainstorm, you know, I said to Simon, you know, this center is all about history. I know it's history of a certain era. You know, a lot of people think of it as colonial history or 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and that kind of stuff. But part of the real strong history of this community being located sort of halfway between New York and halfway between Philly uh, is music. Um, and if you look backwards, even from the time of the 60s, you go back to the 50s, 40s, 30s, and you go back to the 1800s. If you want to go back to that kind of history that people most often associate with a facility like this, a history center, you know. Um, you can see that Berks County always swung way above its weight class in terms of music. Mm -hmm. We had bands. Almost every community had a band. Almost every community, and I'm including rural uh, communities, mm -hmm. agricultural communities, uh, let alone the inner city, they all had band shells. And they all had like town bands, community bands. The Reading Railroad, at one point the largest um, industry in the United States, corporation, they had their own marching band. Like this was all influenced by the Germanic influence that came over from the Rhineland and places like uh, Kuzel and the Saarbrücken and these places where uh, umpa music was really popular, right? So uh, they had these bands that were modeled after that, the big bass drums and the horns and the umpa, umpa, um, and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and Ringgold Band came out of the Ringgold Artillery Unit that was called by Abraham Lincoln to go and fight in the Civil War. They uh, called together a band to rally troops and liven up spirits, which is still something we use music for today. Mm -hmm. That group came from this area. And, and you have some family history with that as well. Do you, do you have a, a family member or something? I do, the, right, I do, I do, band? sure. I mean, it's interesting. So for me, I've been like a, I've been like a tea bag steeped in it. <laughs> there, there was no escape, if you will, for me, and I, I'm sure I wouldn't want to have any escape. So in my family, on my, on my mother's side, my grandfather, who came from Sicily, was a classically trained French horn player. And he taught. 
And the stories are, you know, he taught students for pennies sometimes. He kept journals. I still have those journals, by the way, of how much he charged the students. Sometimes he taught for free, especially during the Depression, because he had promising students that couldn't afford lessons, so he gave them. But anyway, uh, his name was Samuel Martyrano. He uh, was the first chair French horn player at that in his era with the Reading Symphony Orchestra. And we were going back be before, like, 1920, in, like, in that era. Mm -hmm. um, he was a contemporary of uh, John Philip Sousa. Uh, he played with the Ringgold Band and conducted the Ringgold Band on occasion. He conducted the Reading Symphony Orchestra on occasion. Wow. Uh, one of his big claims to fame was uh, he went with the, I think it was the Ringgold Band, when they were summoned by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt for his first inaugural uh, party, you know, down there in Washington where they had the big praise and stuff. So my grandfather went down there and performed with a band for FDR. And then... He was in the rehearsal with the Ringgold Band when John Philip Sousa played in town here. And you know, there's a plaque at the Abraham Lincoln Hotel yes. because John Philip Sousa, unfortunately, went to a Ringgold Band <laughs> rehearsal, uh, came across the street and died. Mm -hmm. He said he wasn't feeling good at the rehearsal. That's really all they can remember. It was no big deal. He passed away and it, was my, it fell on my grandfather because he had a, a lot of connections in the music community. He was a uh, person who brought people together. He believed in the fellowship of musicians as some sort of special brother and sisterhood. And I believe that too. And um, so it fell on him to call together musicians from all walks of life to see if they wanted to volunteer to perform on a cold, windy March day. Cold, gray, windy March day, as my grandmother, who's now passed away, had explained it to me many times. Um, and they met at the station here in Reading, at the Reading Railroad, for Sousa's funeral train. It's hard for us to imagine in this day and age, but John Philip Sousa was like the rock star of his, of his age. Yeah. Right? Real, truly, truly big, big stuff. And he liked it here in Reading. He played here in Reading. Reading was a major hub for him. So when he died, thousands and thousands of people came out to see him off in the train. That's how they could express themselves. And what a better way to see him off than have a wonderful uh, Sousa-like band, which is the Ringgold Band emulates, right? Um, go ahead and play for him. So that's a little bit of family history. My grandfather was a teacher, a composer, um, a performer. And uh, a visionary that way. And if you look back in the old Reading Eagle newspapers, a long time ago, you can you can find all these articles about this is what Sam Martirana wrote. Now look at this piece of music and that piece of music. Um, so anyway, fast forwarding to the era that we're talking about here with this display and this great organization. You know, we were being hit up by influences from the Jersey Shore. You had people from New Jersey, you know. Uh, you had people from Philadelphia, the, the uh, doo-wop sound. You had people from New York. East Coast was a happening thing. And Reading, being right in the middle of that, we were a happening place. We were spawning band after band after band. And when the Beatles hit, that was it for me. I, being raised in a half Sicilian, half German home, Got all kinds of musical influences. My mother, you know, professional dancer. She toured like with a group that would be like the Rockettes. Um, I think they were called Marie Shaw dancers. Wow. With some of her cousins, you know, the Italian people. They they had a a good time with that. You know, we had Shorty Long, Italian guy who became, uh, -huh. uh you know, Emilio Vagnoni became Shorty Long, the cowboy, right? Um, they had this flair, this penchant for show business and to entertain. So there was a lot of exposure to that up here. And in my family, I started playing the accordion. That's what my had a lessons with accordion. First, it was my Aunt Betty that gave me lessons on my accordion. Then it was a professional guy, Bobby Ray, who has recently passed away. Bob Lillaros was his name, but his stage name was Bobby Ray. He gave me accordion lessons. That was all good up until the time I went to uh, my first band tryout at Muhlenberg uh, junior high, I think it was, the band leader was Hank Hoffman, mm -hmm. and literally my mother forced me to take my accordion for the tryout, <laughs> and I took my accordion, talk about being mortified as a kid, right? Uh, I didn't even get it out of the case yet. I opened the case, and the Hank Hoffman walked by, he looked at me, and he said, <laughs> his reaction was, oh, take that squeeze box home. We'll get you another <laughs> instrument. So that was the end of my accordion career. I wish I would have stuck with it, actually, because accordions are pretty cool, uh, as it turns out with folkloric music and stuff. But So then I started studying saxophone. Then I studied drums. Then I said, you know, I was just kind of adrift. And to tell you the truth, I really didn't care for those things. They didn't really resonate or click with me um, until I saw the Beatles. Well, first I heard the Beatles at a place called Eagles Mountain Home. It's now uh, the Reading Liederkranz. But back in those days, it was the Eagles... 
uh, Mountain Home, I think was the name of it. It was a club, and the Italian side of our family used to always go up there for all kinds of reunions and family gatherings, and there was a jukebox. So they had everything in that jukebox from goofy polka music, you know, to, uh, to this 45 that my older cousin, she was a female, she said, she called me David Lee, David Lee, David Lee, you got to come hear this, come hear this, come hear this in the jukebox. She put her nickel in, that's probably all it cost. And on came, I want to hold your hand, and she loves you. Um, wow, that was the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! I mean, I didn't know that was a Little Richard thing long before Paul McCartney kind of ripped it off from Little Richard. That, but wow, that that was it for me. And, and as with so many, I mean, tens of millions of people, that was it for them. There was something magical about that. And from that point, I told my mom I wanted to be a musician. I really didn't take anything else seriously in school. Uh, the things that I took most seriously in school were anything creative, so like drama club, drama competitions, um, uh, writing class, literature, um, typing, because in those days we didn't have computers. So I had a very, very forward-thinking typing teacher at Muhlenberg High School and a very, very forward-thinking English literature teacher, Mr. Moyer, and I believe my typing teacher was Mrs. Fessler. And they talked to each other because of the proclivities I was showing. I wasn't your normal student at all. I mean, if I wasn't interested in it, I really wasn't interested in it. Maybe that's not something to be proud of, but like, I just didn't care. Like, I didn't, I couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. And um, they helped me through this by allowing me to write lyrics and poems on the typewriter. So wow. my typing class was all about like, you, you, everybody else is doing this. You can type whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Uh, Mr. Moyer, and, yeah, and yeah, and Mr. Moyer, the English lit teacher, instead of making me do all those normal lessons or abnormal lessons to me, you know, like it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't, I, it didn't click with me. Like I said, what did click with me was sitting there for hours in class writing, showing him, turning in instead of turning in the normal type of papers you turn in, I would turn in books of poetry, books of song lyrics, and he would grade them and he would read them, and he really would read them. He'd write comments down, this and that, and encouraging comments or uh, good good criticisms, you know. And hmm. it turns out that I don't know how they do it now, but in those days, like to graduate, one of the things you had to do is create like a senior paper or a senior something, you know. Mm -hmm. And somebody might do one about the status of asphalt in, uh, you know, I don't know where, Moton, uh, <laughs> whatever, <Sure. laughs> whatever their serious paper was about. I couldn't, I didn't dig it. I didn't get it, you know. I just, uh, I felt a little different like the brick out of the wall then you know because mm -hmm. there's a systemized way of doing things and i certainly didn't march to the beat of that drum because the whole time you have to also know that my mother the showbiz mom i was doing from five years old i was doing live theater uh, live mc work live performing wow. so i had my school life which is almost surreal because it was like this is really kind of boring I'd rather be doing this because it's creative. This is where I feel most alive. So, but I, I endured it. You have to, right? It's the law. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when it came time for this final uh, graduation paper, those two teachers allowed me to do what I proposed. I said, listen, could I just create, like for me, it would have been like a masterwork, like the summation of uh, my high school years of uh, a collection of uh, the stuff that I really like and that you like. And could I, instead of just writing about nothing that's interesting to me, could I just submit that? Because that's where I've spent all my time. I would spend time at night writing. I would, you know, this is, I, I, time was not an issue. You know how sometimes you're studying something you hate and it's like, oh my God, what time is it? Sure. Oh my God, I got to stay up to three in the morning and study this. Or whatever. That's forced learning. I'm not sure that's so good. Mm -hmm. now, not everybody's meant to be this or that or the other thing. Some are meant to be other things. So they let me do that. And <laughs> I'm really, I got an A++ on that. Hmm. And that was like my first big shot of adrenaline in the arm that was like, Oh, you know what, maybe this is what's meant to be, mm -hmm. that validated me. They validated, mm -hmm. those people validated me. And as I look back on that, uh, I can't say anything more, but thank you to those teachers sure. for being, for being yeah. that kind of a person and for getting it. So um, then the Beatles came, like I said. And so then we started a little band in our neighborhood. Our little band uh, was designed so that we could uh, play for birthday parties for kids in the neighborhood. Uh, we had a couple older girls that would have birthday parties, and they thought it would be cool to have a little band. So our little band was we had we wore all the same color uh, pants, jeans, I guess, bell bottom blue jeans, elephant bells, not just bell bottoms, elephant, you know, big ridiculously wide. Um, we wore blue shirts with a Nehru collar. You know what that is? Like this thing right over here. I don't 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if the folks can see it, but I believe that's Joey Drumheller's too, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, we wore these Nehru collar shirts and we wore these big, gaudy, bright, like Mexican gold medallions here. That was our thing. It looked cool, you know, it was cool. And we go down in people's basements and the only person that actually played an instrument was me. I played the drums. We'd put the records on, like the Beatles records, and then my buddy Steve, he would play a broom. He'd play like he was playing the broom. <laughs> not, not, not kidding you. <laughs> and the other guy, like another guy would be playing something just as bad, you know, like that. It wasn't an instrument. And then I would sing. I'm a, I sang. So I would be drumming and singing to these records, and the guys would all be doing their thing. And, and look, we look, we look cool. We made our own light effects. So I took an old turntable that I had as a kid, one of those little things that you'd play those kiddie records on. Mm -hmm. And I strapped a flashing red and blue flashlight to it. And our big effect was we'd lower the lights in the room. We'd turn that thing on. It would spin around like this in the room and throw blue and red light all around the room. And we'd play. And we'd play a lot of parties like that. And, you know, we never got paid anything. I think cake or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was a good first experience. And then for me, from there, it was uh, up in the high school years where I was still doing live theater, a lot of live theater, and working with the local theater groups. I mean, I was involved with our drama club had traveled and at a high school level competed at on the collegiate level there was such a thing as drama competition so we do mm -hmm. short plays hmm. and at the same time though I was going around to like Reading Civic Opera it was called at that time um, performing in some of those uh, musicals Broadway musicals and was working with Genesius Theater which was a wonderful experience Jane Miller um, if you've ever run across anybody that wants to talk about Jane fascinating person um, it literally walked into a pharmacy. I was working at Myers Pharmacy. This is like the stories you hear of Grumman's Chinese Theater in out west there in California. Walks into Myers Pharmacy in Temple, looks at me and says to her colleague, who happened to be uh, Michael Flannery, great prolific composer, and says, oh my God, a young Victor Mature. You never even heard of Victor Mature, did you? No. Look him up. He was in these old movies like Hercules. He was just this guy, you know, and had that black hair. My hair was black then. And, and, and she's like, you need to be in our next production of 1776. <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay. Because why not, right? Experience it.